Okay, good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. What a fantastic showing. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to our 2018 Executive Ethics Symposium. Uh, my name is Paul Melendez, and I have the real pleasure of serving as a professor in our Department of Management. I'm also the very proud founder of our Center for Leadership Ethics and you are about to experience one of our premier programs. And we are just absolutely delighted to see so many friendly faces here. I see our board members, I see alumni, I see students, and I see a lot of people who are also at some point gonna become part of our larger Eller family. So thank you. This is our first foray into the Phoenix market as a center, and I don't think we could have picked a, a, a finer place to do our event. So thank you for all the hospitality and, and for being such wonderful hosts. I'd like to also thank, uh, where is Anne? Yeah, Miss Ann Hetland. Anne. <laughs> as you can imagine, these events just don't happen in a vacuum. Uh, Anne has been working so hard behind the scenes, working with RSVPs, uh, just various questions about the event. So I want to thank Ann for all of our hard work as well. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to call um, our Dean, Dr. Paulo Goas, to the podium. And I'd like to ask him to share a few words with you. So Paulo, please come on up. Starts with uh, access to vast amounts of data. So the data that uh, you feed into these artificial intelligence algorithms, that's the, 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 the foundation. So ethics starts there, right? The type of data you collect, what you do with the data, how you store it, the unintended consequences of keeping all kinds of data in places and what people are going to, to do that. And then as you move up the artificial intelligence uh, layers, it's about uh, developing algorithms for automated decision, automated decision making. And that's what ethics is, right? When you make decisions, there are ethical implications. So if you think about uh, now everything's automated in a smart way, 
you lose control of, of the organization. So, so I'm really looking forward to hearing from these great panelists because uh, we need to be talking about these issues, we need to be thinking about these issues, and I couldn't be happier to be here uh, as the Yale College Dean uh, kicking off the, this meeting. Thank you so much. Thank you. For those of you that know Dr. Goez, you, you should know this, this topic really is very close to heart. He is our former MIS department head and a professor of MIS. So as you can imagine, you know, he is an authority himself. So thank you, uh, Dean Goez, for being here this morning. Uh, I'd like to also ask our sponsor, I should actually say sponsors, uh, both Doug and Claudia Zanes are very, very good friends to the college and to the center. Um, they are. They, they have been supporters of past symposia, and uh, this past year when I came to Doug and Claudia, uh, the answer was yes, we'd love to uh, get behind the event. So I'd like to ask Doug to please come to the podium and say a few words, and I'd like to thank both Doug and Claudia for their generous sponsorship. Thank you both. interesting things we can learn. I mean, Claudia and I have supported this program, or the Center for Leadership Ethics, for a number of years now. And really, when we first got involved, you know, I really had no idea what it was about. Um, and it's really kind of been an evolution. I mean, it's really sort of easy to, on the surface, talk about ethical decision making and what goes into it. But the reality of it is, if it was easy, we we wouldn't be bombarded with unethical decisions every time we turn the news on. I mean, that really is every news cycle these days, whether it's, you know, the political arena, whether it's business decisions that have been made, um, uh, you know, where investors have lost a lot of money or from their perspective probably had their money stolen from them. Uh, you know, it's, it really comes down to choices. And really what we like, what Claudia and I think like about or really support about the Center for Leadership Ethics is really its approach. Um, you know, in academia, there's a tendency to, for everything to be theoretical. Um, you know, now, uh, the program has a huge research base to it. Uh, they, I think everybody involved in the program spends a lot of time researching uh, the topic. But I think more important than that, is the practical side of the program. I mean, for those of you who don't know, the center actually has a high school forum that goes on each year, where they act the program actually uh, works with high school kids uh, and uh, works on ethical decision making. Every year they have a collegiate uh, competition where Colleges send actual teams, and all the schools are, I think, from the U.S., Mexico, and Canada, and two-person teams will come down, and Paul gives them a, a topic that they prepare for, and they come and present their uh, presentation, and they've got to address the ethical dilemmas within whatever that topic is. And the whole idea behind it, again, is to get these younger people in tune with ethical decision-making, you know, which... You know, the real idea is over a lifetime, you know, these same young people, when they have a choice to pay all their taxes or maybe pay half their taxes, they'll make the right decision that keeps them out of trouble or keeps their business out of trouble or is just the decision that should be made uh, across the board, personally, in business, uh, you know, in whatever careers that they choose. And again, you know, if you go back to each news cycle, I think it's a monumental task. I mean, realistically, uh, you know, this is one school in Tucson, Arizona, uh, you, that's making an effort to change this really one person at a time, starting with high school kids and working their way up. You know, and finally, the adults, which is really what this symposium is about. Uh, the business leaders that are invited, the government leaders that are invited, or the nonprofit leaders that 
that come to the symposium uh, each time it occurs. The idea really isn't simply to provide an interesting topic, but to provide the interesting topic and have everybody spend a little bit, bit of time thinking about all sides uh, of the argument. You know, in this case, it's artificial intelligence. I think the last one uh, that at least we sponsored had to do with vice investing or investing. Is it okay? Should you invest in vice products? Should you not? Uh, things that go on every day um, in everybody's lives. And so, you know, it's a fantastic program. And I can tell you, uh, the Eller School of Business, uh, Paul, have done a phenomenal job with this program. And the more support it has uh, within both the Tucson and Phoenix communities, uh, the more the program can excel. Because the reality of it is, is there aren't many of these programs across the country, only a handful of schools have them. And I think my personal belief is this is by far the best. So thank you all for coming. Uh, and I hope you guys have a good experience. Wow, what a plug. So I, I, that just took about two or three minutes off of the back end of my talk. Thank you, Doug, for saying such wonderful <laughs> things about the center and, and Claudia as well. I know that both of you as, as co-business owners are, are very much the reason why we're here today. So thanks again. Very much appreciated. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and read you uh, the bios for our three panelists. And then I'm just going to say a few words. And then the best part for me is I get to just kind of pull to the side and let our wonderful panel uh, do what they're going to do this morning. We have three um, panelists here today, and I'm going to start out by introducing you, and if you wouldn't mind standing, we've got Mike Wolfson here, who is a principal software enge engineer with The Nerdy, which definitely has to go now as one of the finest business names of, of the morning. Uh, Mike has been working in the software field for more than 20 years and with Android since its introduction. He is a Google developer expert in Android and the author of a book, Android Developer Tools Essentials, published by O'Reilly. Mike works for The Nerdy as the principal software engineer and helps run the local IoT DVS Fest conference. How about a round of applause for Mike Wilson? I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Moji Solji to stand. Uh, he is the Director of Artificial Intelligence and Machine Learning with Axon Enterprises, Inc. Uh, Soji oversees the AI organization at Axon. Formerly, Soji was with Uber, Microsoft, and Toyota in research and engineering roles, where he leveraged his machine learning expertise to create real-time computer vision solutions and distributed software systems for various problems, including map data and self-driving car technologies. He holds a PhD in machine learning from Michigan State University, which I know is bringing a smile to Dr. Ellis, our research director of the center. So I know the two of you are probably going to be talking this afternoon. So thank you, Dr. Soji. And I'd like to ask uh, Ms. Lisa Morgan to please stand. So Lisa is a journalist, industry analyst, and content strategist. Uh, Lisa is a focuses on the impact of technology on business and society. She is also a digital ethics, ethics activist who spearheads content and community for the IEEE's global initiative on ethics of autonomous and intelligent systems, which now has more than a thousand members. She holds a BA in management with honors from St. Mary's College and a JD from Monterey College of Law. How about a warm round of applause for Lisa? So, I'm going to tee up the event here. Um, many, many years ago, and I know Dr. Ellis might recall this, we had a, a faculty from Harvard visit us. Remember Dr. Bazerman? And it was interesting because he triggered a memory that I had from many, many years ago as an undergrad. And it had to do with the trolley problem. How many of you are familiar with the trolley problem? Well, for those of you that, that aren't, we're going to have a little fun. Anne is raising her hand because she heard me talk, talk through this as we drove up from uh, Tucson yesterday. So here's the problem. You have a trolley barreling down the track. No brakes. There is Steve, who's standing right there, seeing the whole thing uh, occur in real time. If he doesn't do anything, the trolley's going to run into these five people that are tied down to the track. However, there's a switch next to him. 
he pulls the switch, he can redirect the trolley to another track, saving five, but killing one person who's on the other track. How many of you would go ahead and pull the switch? One person dies to save five. Okay, the majority of you say yes. Some of you are saying, imperfect information. <laughs> I like more options, and that is one of the weaknesses of the trolley problem, but go with me on this. Well, here's another interesting one that's very, very similar. Same scenario, except now Steve's standing on top of a footbridge. The trolley's barreling down the track. If he doesn't do anything, it's going to kill five people. However, there's a very, very, very large man in front of him. And if he pushes him off the footbridge, he will die, but he will save five people. How many of you would opt for that option? Well, we have to talk. No, 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 I'm just kidding. <laughs> Usually you see the numbers drop off pretty significantly. The reason why I like the trolley problem is because it illustrates from a philosophical standpoint different schools of thought, right? There are some that are what I like to call the results-based, right? The ends justify the means, and there are others that say, no, no, this is about duty, right? You, you, the means justify the ends, and under no circumstances could this be justified. As I said earlier, one of the limitations of the trolley problem is its practicality, which we've heard about earlier, until now. When you think a little bit about, among other things, with AI, um, self-driving cars, and the software engineering that goes behind that, don't you think it would be a good idea for some of those software engineers to think a little through the different permutations that will come up in the event that that vehicle has to make decisions? And we don't want those decisions to be made in a void. So I think in many ways, this kind of brings a lot of salience to today's session. Now, for those of you who want more on the topic other than what we're going to get through today, we have lots in store for you. Uh, this year's Collegiate Ethics Case Competition is going to focus on this very topic. In fact, I've got the first draft of the case. I'm looking at Colonel Sable. Yes, I will get it to you for your proofreading. Um, it's going to focus on this topic, and, and here's what I've learned, not just from doing my own research, but having the benefit of having spoken with our panelists and others in the college. It's a nascent technology, right? It has a lot of potential impact with a variety of stakeholders. It's got financial implications, legal implications, and of course, ethical implications. It touches everything that we do, right? From self-driving cars, to voice command servers, to uh, navigational apps, virtual assistants, the Internet of Things, and of course, facial recognition. Now, I'm looking at Gabby here. PwC just published a recent, recent, recent report from a financial standpoint. AI is projected to contribute to the global economy $15 trillion by 2030. To put that in context, that's bigger than the outputs of China and India combined. From a legal standpoint, it's pretty loosely regulated, right? I would think that most of us would agree, but this is part of our panel's discussion today, that if we're talking about AI technologies or products that affect safety, we're probably going to want more guardrails. But if we're talking about general services, right, just general products, we're probably going to feel a little bit more lenient. If you haven't paid close attention, Microsoft and Amazon represent the two ends of the spectrum right now. How many of you have read up on those two companies? Microsoft has really kind of tapped on the brakes and said, there's a lot here we can't think everything through. We need government regulation. Can you believe it? This is the same Microsoft that just came through an antitrust case, remember, just a few years ago? And then you have on the other end of the spectrum, Amazon, who's saying, no, 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 no. Keep plowing forward. This is innovation at its finest. If we begin to regulate too early, it could stymie innovation. Had we done this with the Internet, where would we be today? So from a legal standpoint, it's still very, very, very much in the air. But from an ethical standpoint, there's a lot to be discussed. And that's really the core of what we're going to do today. I think most of us would agree that AI that could affect our privacy, our security, our safety, are our areas worthy of consideration. But we also have to be concerned with the fact that a lot of the AI is still very much a black box, right? And what people are really beginning to talk about, in fact, I would say even shout about, is the need for transparency, right? There are biases, which some of our panelists are going to get to today, that really need to be discussed. And so that's where we're at today. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and ask our first panelist, um, Mike, to go ahead and take the podium. Each of our panelists has roughly 10 minutes. Um, they're going to move through their presentations, and at the very end, we're going to throw it open to questions. And that will be just as engaging as the presentation. So 
I'd like to go ahead and switch over. And uh, Mike, I'll have you take the podium. Well, good morning. Um, thank you so much for coming. I know it's early, um, and I, I'm super excited to be here. Um, so my name is Mike Wolfson, and um, as Paul mentioned, I work at The Nerdery. So I am a software engineer, hands-on, keyboard-type guy, solving problems every day. That's what I do. Um, so I wanted to go through this exercise this morning to kind of expose you to a path I took through a simple project I was working through, and we'll kind of uh, build up this story to kind of expose some of the um, uh, nuances of image classification. All right, so uh, the title of my presentation is Image Classification is Easy. I had a really hard time coming up with a topic for this presentation or a title. Um, I want it to be really snappy and short, um, but as we go through the presentation, you'll see why that title doesn't really fit. Okay, so um, living here in Phoenix, I have a pool in my backyard, um, which is a really nice thing. Love, enjoy it so much. However, I have a really big problem. The problem is birds. Birds like to come into my yard and leave their leavings at the end of the day. Um, so I don't like that at all, right? It's a real problem for me. So uh, me and a couple of my engineering friends were sitting around one night drinking a couple Dr. Peppers, and we start to think about how we can uh, solve this problem, right? As engineers, I want to uh, find code and uh, find a, a solution for the problem. As I mentioned, I'm also an IoT enthusiast, so the simplest solution I could come up with is hook into my sprinkler system. Every time a bird flies into my yard, I'm going to uh, take a picture of that, figure out if it's a bird. <coughs> It was a bird, <laughs> flew by, right, exactly. Um, every time a bird comes into my yard, I'm gonna turn on the sprinklers, get rid of that bird. Problem solved, super easy. So my first step, and this is the only eye chart I will ever put in a slide deck, um, first step for me is to go find an API, find a solution that I can use to get image classification done. Um, this slide is super cool, and I just wanted to put it on here. If you guys search for Siobhan um, Zillis, uh, Machine Intelligence uh, uh, Architecture, this is kind of a really good chart of all the different companies that are right now involved actively, primarily in AI. These companies all have AI focus and all do things specifically. So if I start to dig into this chart a little bit, I can see that there's a bunch of companies that offer me just image classification services. A kind of interesting nuance is there's even companies that offer healthcare image classification services specifically. Um, super interesting nuance. Um, I'm not going to go too much into the nature of selecting an API provider or an image classification service. Um, that is really hard. That's the first step where image classification is hard, is understanding which of these services to use. Um, I'm not going to go too much into that for this discussion because I only have 10 minutes, but uh, this chart should give you a little bit of an idea of the uh, companies that are involved in this business right now and how uh, much of the, uh, how many people there are. Okay, so figuring out if a bird flies into my yard is going to be pretty simple enough. Each of these different classification services can easily identify a bird. Um, so that's going to be pretty simple. However, I also have to consider the fact that my dog is going to be in the backyard and I don't want to spray him every time he goes out into the yard because he's probably then going to decide he just wants to do his business inside my house. So that's not going to work at all. So it starts to become a little more difficult of a problem because I can't just figure out if a bird's there. I have to start figuring out if other animals are in my yard and not turn on the sprinkler for them. So a bird, you can start to think about the differences between a bird and a dog, right? Uh, shape of the head maybe, feathers, size of the animal, different things. Um, but these characteristics start to become very complicated. It starts to become difficult to understand how you are going to train your AI model to get the nuanced details out that you need. So what if a owl were to come into my yard? 
Now, I like owls. Owls eat bugs, eat insects, eat all sorts of other mice. So it's going to be a little difficult to figure out the difference between an owl and a bird, right? They both have feathers. They have similar shaped heads. I don't want to scare away the owl. I do want to scare away the bird. What about a uh, giraffe, right? This one's pretty easy. I mean, it gets kind of far-fetched, but uh, also you might have you know, a gorilla. I want to make sure that I'm only turning on the sprinklers when the bird comes, not the gorilla. Um, so this is the first time when I decided I better start changing the title of this talk because it turns out image classification is not easy. There's a whole lot of nuanced detail to this, and if you're not careful, um, it can create big challenges. So, okay, so let's talk about some challenges with image classification. Does anybody know where this is going? Okay, well, at least well, at least one guy does. Image classification is really hard, and if uh, there's a very um, well-known example where Google was misclassifying black males as gorillas. Super bad. This is a super big problem. This is introducing incredible bias into our image classification services. Uh, super duper bad, and I'm sure you guys all heard of that. Um, but as you can read on this slide, um, that's a, not a problem that they've actually solved. As of right now, if you want to go classify a gorilla, it won't be classified. The way that Google solved this is they don't classify gorillas anymore. So they're not able to solve the problem of uh, differentiating between black males and gorillas. Their solution is to not classify gorillas. Um, and by the way, I actually duplicated this in uh, Microsoft Azure. Um, uh, but the reason I kind of use this example is uh, to prove image classification is really hard. And I want to talk a little bit more about why this is. Okay, so there was a lady named Joy Bula Bualawam. This is why I brought the paper, because I knew I'd have to read it. Joy Bualawamini. Um, she is a researcher at MIT. Uh, when she was at uh, Georgia Tech, she realized that a lot of image, uh, she's a black lady. Uh, she realized that a lot of image recognition software wasn't uh, recognizing her where it was recognizing her Caucasian colleagues. Um, so when she went to MIT, she did some research into the core data sets that a lot of the image, trans uh, image classification services are using. Uh, COCO and MC2 are the two uh, image, classification, uh, image data sets that she looked at. So these are um, data sets that have uh, hundreds of thousands of images in them that are then uh, have um, annotations describing what's in those images. When they looked at the contents of those data sets, they learned that 80% of the content of those data sets were men. So 80% men, 20% women, and 75% uh, white to 25% the rest. Um, so what, it, what they learned is that those core data sets, um, that machine learning, when it is trained on data sets that are biased, it not only uh, mirrors that bias, it actually uh, amplifies that bias. So it's extremely important that as um, technologists, we are conscious of this bias and we're aware of that. Um, so I wanna kind of talk a little bit about how, in particular, gender and racial bias can be factored in unexpected ways into image classification. Um, so uh, the stakes are pretty low in my uh, sprinkler example, right? The worst that's gonna happen is a giraffe is gonna get wet knees, right? Not so bad. But if we start to talk about image classification and making decisions based on these factors, it becomes much more problematic, right? When we're making, uh, uh, we, when we're making uh, recommendations about health or finance or uh, you know, uh, mortgages, this, these decisions are extremely important and we need to be extremely uh, cognizant that we are not um, amplifying the biases that are built into these data sets. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about um, what this researcher did and um, uh, what she determined some of the biases are presenting themselves. So she, she went and she uh, classified 1,200 different uh, facial images. Um, the interesting thing to note is where she got these images is she went to um, uh, Scandinavian and African countries. Uh, she, 
let me step back for a second. She actually looked for countries that have predominantly female women in government. She then picked Nordic and African countries to uh, find faces to recognize. And then she fed these all into three different uh, facial recognition systems um, to test their accuracy. Um, short story short, if you're white, image accuracy and image classification is super great. If you're not white, it's super bad. So for males, if you're white and you're trying to get gender classification, you'll have a 99% uh, accuracy rate. These image classification uh, services will properly gender classify you 99% of the time if you're a white male. If you're a black male, it, that goes down to 93%. Um, still, that's not great, right? You now have a, I'm sorry, it goes down to 12%. So you have a 1 in 10 chance if you're a black male of being misgendered, and a 1 in 100 chance if you're white. Now, if you're a woman and you're a black woman, that gets much, much worse. The chances of being misidentified uh, with gender, if you're a black woman, go up to 35%. So you have a 1 in 3 chance of being misidentified by machine learning if you're a black woman. That's just the nature of the problem. Super important that we're cognizant of that. Um, so the interesting thing is researchers and AI uh, researchers are able to undo these biases and uh, um, retrain their models to accommodate for these things, but they have to be aware that the biases exist and they have to be very cognizant of the methods they're using to, to take out the biases. So it's not enough to just remove the biases, you also have to create uh, your algorithm in a certain way that's going to accommodate for those things. Okay, so we know the problem. I just wanted to go through a few um, quick examples to kind of highlight um, how these things manifest themselves. Uh, first thing was uh, these data sets were identifying sporting goods and uh, things like fishing more predominantly with men, right? Uh, so if you're a fisher, if, you, if you're fishing, it assumes that you're a man. If you're in the kitchen, it assumes you're a woman. Also, if you're um, cleaning, it predominantly assumes you're a woman. These are kind of bad biases, right? We don't want to assume that. And I hope that you notice the pictures I've taken are completely gender neutral. Well, except for that one. That, that's definitely a woman fishing. It's proof that women do fish, but uh, we all know that. Uh, if you're in a kitchen and you're cleaning, the image classifications are more likely to assume that you're a woman. Uh, Pictures of keyboards and mice are more predominantly associated with males. So it's important to kind of think about some of these things because these are the biases that we also are seeing in the technology industry in general. And you can start to see how these biases both um, be, get created and also uh, get persisted. Uh, here's an interesting one. So um, black tennis players were being mis, uh, misclassified as black baseball players because there weren't enough players, black tennis players in the data set to be able to identify that black people actually play tennis. So this is a black baseball player. So you can start to see how some of these biases um, in the data sets become problematic over long term. Okay, this picture of a doctor and a nurse is my last one. Um, and um, this is kind of a little trick. I want to know if anybody has any idea what might have been misgendered in this. Uh, picture. She's the doc and he's the nurse. Very good. This is actually my wife um, and her nurse is the gentleman that's um, standing next to her. So, um, Okay, so that's it for my presentation. You can start to change your thing. One um, thing I did want to mention is so I did finally come up with a topic for this presentation. Image classification is not easy because bias is real and we all need to be really conscious of that when we're working with machine learning. It's not a very catchy title, but um, <laughs> I do think it probably is a little more accurate to what um, my message was. Um, and then the one last thing is I did want to tell you guys my solution for my bird problem. It was uh, the $25 discs that uh, you hang from a tree from Amazon that uh, uh, make light shine in all sorts of different ways. So it turns out that technology is not always the proper solution for problems. So.
Thank you, Mike, and thank you, Dr. Melendez, for inviting me. Good morning, everyone. I'm really excited to be here. I'll keep this one very short and to the point, and uh, I think the most interesting part of the discussions will be when we have the QA part. Uh, I just want to start by opening this question of why we need to talk about ethics on AI and machine learning. Besides, I really like this picture, so <laughs> that's the main reason I have a separate slide for this. Is AI evil? That, that's something, if you have read the news starting from 2016, if you look at all the news that comes out, oh, Elon Musk is saying AI is going to take over, over, it's going to probably kill us all. We had Stephen Hawkins, late Stephen Hawkins now, that, that used to say it could be worse than nuclear weapons. And those people, I think they're genuinely concerned. But there is also a different side of the spectrum. This guy, Rodney Brooks, is one of the legends of machine learning. And he says, if you really are worried about this at this point, just close the door. They cannot. <laughs> They cannot come in. And we have Andrew Ng from Stanford, who is one of the authorities on AI. His point is worrying about machine learning and AI taking over at this point is, about, is the same as worrying about uh, overpopulation in Mars. So that's another point of view. Now, before I go to the next slide, I want to emphasize that the, the both two ends of spectrum that Dr. Melendez started with is really very real for me. I come from Seattle where both Microsoft and Amazon are based. And you see across the lake there, they're fighting this battle. And it's one of the hottest topics in the, in the world, at least in my world, since I'm really deep in this. So um, I think it's going to be super interesting. Now I want to address why is there the, that, that huge disparity between some people thinking that, oh, it's fine, some people thinking, oh, it, it can really be dangerous and we should be careful. I think the main difference comes because of uh, these two different things that people uh, mix together. So one is intelligence, one is autonomy. If you look at the horizontal axis in intelligence and get that could go from low to high, vertical axis is autonomy could go from low to high. What we see if you have low intelligence and high autonomy some people, specifically teenagers, have been like that, could be like that, right? So autonomy is, is the, they, they really can, can take many decisions and it could be dangerous. What AI is at right now, and in the foreseeable future, at least from a technical point of view, is going to be high intelligence. It's going to be increasingly more and more intelligent and being able to solve problems, but it is not autonomous. There is no, uh, at least technical path or, or any, theoretical view of saying there's a way for us to, to make AI autonomous in terms of having its own uh, willpower. So IBM Watson is able to uh, defeat the world champion in, in Jeopardy or um, Google DeepMind can, can beat the, uh, at the Go game, beat the world champion, but they don't even know that they won. And it's all completely uh, in a way that, that when people repeat these things, you end up maybe believing that, that something is going on, but as far as we know, there's nothing going on in terms of self-consciousness. However, there are real concerns. As someone who runs an organization of um, machine learning researchers and engineers and, and scientists, every day we have to deal with, with these problems. And I'm glad that Mike mentioned the example of the Gorilla and, and, and Google, that, that's super famous at this point. Uh, and it also ties upon the, the problem of bias, interpretability is, is one real problem that I hope we'll discuss in the Q&A part. Um, privacy, of course, uh, Dr. Melendez touched upon and, and security. So these are the real things that I think need our immediate attention. And uh, I would focus my organization and, and I would like to ask the, the community of researchers in AI and machine learning to really focus on, on these things at this point. Um, Philosophizing and, and thinking about the future and the, the trolley problem, th those are all great. Um, the things that are eminent are, are so some of these points that I pointed out here. Now, I want to go one by one to kind of set my point of view and perspective. And as, as you, you see during the, the Q&A, that, that's going to be kind of my position and 
it's a very hot topic and people have different positions. Uh, one example that, so looking back in history, when, when else did we, did we have similar technologies that had great potential and, and people were concerned? One was the, the Human Genome Project. And um, at that time, a lot of people said we should put a stop to it and, and not, not proceed. It, it could be dangerous. It could um, end the human civilization as we know it. There was an ethics board formed, and, and uh, people really did the due diligence, and, and the very useful uh, application of uh, genomic technology is being used now, and a lot of lives are saved. So that's one example that we did really well. Now, a lot of people say data science and big data and data is a new oil. Oil is one example that we did not do very well. Um, we, we made a big mess and the uh, environment is, is suffering. So the first case says, yes, regulation was good. The second case was that says uh, regulation didn't really help us much. Um, and one thing that, that I want to emphasize in terms of my, my point of view is that if you start from somewhere where organic research and bottom-up technology development is allowed and, and we do the regulations um, to a degree that we do not impede research, uh, that's usually beneficial. Uh, I'm perhaps the most non-American person on the panel, but that, that's basically the American view in, in, in my uh, point of view, at least the, the way I see it. A lot of people would do a top-down system um, where you have the, the head deciding what to do and then it comes down in terms of very exact regulation. Um, the United States has been super successful in, in uh, implementation of technologies in the past two centuries, mostly because they've let the low-level tinkering and engineers and uh, practitioners to take initiative and develop these technologies, yes, cautious, cautiously, yes, under the uh, very thoughtful and considerate planning, uh, but not at the way of somebody coming in and saying, no, we should put a stop to it. And I want to emphasize that uh, doing something like that would be unethical. Why? Because if you say, let's not do AI research because some, something bad could happen, you're also stopping the progress in society in terms of good things that could happen. Many lives could be saved in a few years if, if we had allowed this organic bottom-up research to happen. And if you had stopped it, many lives would be lost. Uh, I touched upon this one other example as I was flying here yesterday. Uh, airplanes, if you think about them, they, they could be super dangerous, but through bottom-up engineering, and if you Again, I come from Seattle, talk to the Boeing engineers that are all out there. It wasn't really a top-down system, and it wasn't really an academic approach to making planes successful at the commercial level. It was low-level tinkering with engineers and, and, and really going through safety measures, and um, it ends up that we put millions and thousands of people on planes every day and every month. They successfully go and come back. If you think about it, that, that's a crazy thing, but it's happening and it's helping us. Uh, the internet, the same thing, Dr. Hernandez touched upon that. And to sum up, I think we should, our approach should be Roman, not Greek. And what that means is throughout surgery, Greek people were, throughout the history, Greek people were more towards uh, academia and uh, kind of uh, very process-oriented and, and philosophical view of things. And I'm not saying that's bad. That, that must also exist. I, I believe at this uh, point where we are in this technology, we should give more breather into uh, responsible and, and uh, bottom-up development of these technologies. And that's the Roman approach. Romans were vehemently against uh, theory and philosophy for a while. But that's, I'm, I'm kind of putting in the contrast, not that it should be that, that black and white. Uh, now, the way I became interested in this, as uh, I was being introduced, you see that most, most of my background, basically all of my background was deeply technical in uh, doing research and engineering in uh, computer vision and AI. When I took over as the head of AI for Axon, it turned out that we have 
a serious issue. The media reaches out to us and we need to be able to responsibly uh, develop these technologies and, and talk about them in, in, in public uh, in a way that both is responsible to the societies that we are serving and also responsible to our customers who are law enforcement officers and also for our employees. As uh, I talk to my team, I get a lot of questions saying that why we are doing this, what are our uh, ethical constraints, what are the guardrails that, guardrails that we are putting in. So we ended up putting together this AI ethics board that is uh, a panel of very distinguished members, uh, as you can see, uh, great resumes. Does anybody here know YOLO? One of the image classification algorithms, uh, probably the most uh, impactful and, and famous one is invented by Dr. Farhadi down here. So, and that, that's the level of talent that we ended up putting on the board. Uh, and our board meets uh, twice a year trying to basically advise us on the responsible and uh, uh, practical development of, of AI technologies in a way that, that doesn't harm the society and, and, and helps them. So this is one thing that has been unprecedented in, uh, in the industry and we ended up getting uh, a lot of kudos on it. Uh, some people, Forbes magazine put us above Google and they said, uh, I, I wish Google or Facebook would have done something like this. So. Uh, that's another thing that I would ask the business community and the, the technology community to put together these ethics boards and help us in organic and bottom-up development of these regulations in a way that every single engineer, every single researcher, every single business person and product developer becomes deeply involved and responsible. So to sum up, I think it, it's uh, mixed bag of opportunity versus responsibility uh, and we don't have all the answers at this point but what has worked for us so far I think it will continue to work if we approach it in a very responsible way and let the builders build and let the creators innovate uh, but also have these discussions have these panel uh, members and have the society be in the loop and aware. Thank you. So we're switching back over, Lisa. Have you come on up? Yeah, good. Good. Thank you very much. Can't believe this worked. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I switched it to hers. Oh, perfect. Jeez. I did that for you. I didn't even need to come up here. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, next life I'm going to be tall and thin. Uh, but anyway, thanks very much for coming. Uh, my presentation, I, and I mean this, AI ethics is everyone's responsibility. A lot of the groups that I work with are very focused on design, as we'll see, but it's not just up to them. And so given my background, given that I'm in, oh, sorry. That one, yeah. okay, sorry. Uh, given that I'm an industry analyst and a journalist, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk about the who, what, where, when, why, and how, albeit out of order. So I'm gonna start with what. So what are we talking about? Well, hello, I mean, we're talking about AI ethics, right? So I want to ask you guys, um, how many of you are comfortable that you know what we mean when we talk about AI ethics? Who's comfortable? Yeah? <laughs> okay, well, gosh, guys. But you know what? I've got an audience of philosophers, and the reason is because, first of all, people are parsing my sentence. First of all, what do I mean by we, right? Do I mean we the panel, we in this room, we the people? Who am I talking about, right? Well, AI. Oh, well, actually people tend to talk less about that because everybody knows what AI is. We see it on TV, we see it in the movies. It's that thing, right? Thing? Okay, well, I'll stipulate that it's a collection of methods, tools, and technologies because recommendation engines and bots and image recognition, these are all different types of things, neural networks, deep learning, all these things. There's many, many things that comprise this. And then, what about ethics? Well, a lot of times people say, 
Ethics, oh yeah, I know what that is. Or I'm on the phone talking to people about this all day and all night. And some people will say, what do you mean by ethics? Well, what do I mean by ethics? Okay, so then I tell them, okay, well, generally what we mean is that it's, it's good. When we talk about something that's ethical, it's good. When it's unethical, it's bad. Okay, so we're fine with that. Great, so that's simple. So now everybody's comfortable and we, kn we know that we're talking about good stuff. But what exactly do we mean by good? And some of you who took philosophy classes will be able to read between the lines, talking about the Greeks here. We're we talking about virtue. We're virtuous, godly, or spiritual. That's good, hey, right? How about law abiding? Are there any police chiefs in the room? I heard that there might be. No? Okay. <laughs> then I can't pick on you later, darn it. Oh, okay. Are we well intentioned? Now this matters too because some of it is, are you well intentioned or is it outcome? <laughs> By the way, my baby brother is 6'6". Six, six. <laughs> <laughs> and good, good for whom? Who are we talking about? This gets to another philosophy. There's lots of different uh, philosophies when it comes to ethics. But are we talking about good for me? That's, I come from Silicon Valley, I'm a Palo Alto native. So good for me, that's good. Good for my pocketbook, good for my company shareholders, right? That, that matters. But are we talking about, how about good for us? Good for us in this room. How about good for everyone in the room? Well, and so what do we mean? Well, so we've got so we've got a problem here, which is diversity. We've, we've talked about bias a little bit in terms of diversity. If we're actually going to approach AI ethically, we need to do it from a diverse standpoint. It can't all be all about white guys and Chinese guys. We have to move beyond that. But that's what makes it so difficult, too. Because, I mean, even here in the United States, look at our political differences. I mean, that's just one example. But when you think about cultures and religions and belief systems and all of this stuff, trying to get everybody together is a very difficult thing. So if I were to ask you, you know, how many of you understand what my personal brand of ethics is? No, you wouldn't. But what about us in the room? If we collectively agreed to this, like I'm working with the IEEE, we just, we put together a 266 page document the last, we're on our third version now, talking about the ethics of autonomous and intelligent systems. First was about 133, second is 266. I'm on the editing committee, I don't know how many, how many we're gonna end up with, but it's a large thing. It has links to everything, okay? And then there's a group up in Seattle that has, they're trying to get to like the Agile Manifesto, if you know anything about software development. That's basically like a one page thing. It just has very, very simple concepts. So this, it falls somewhere in between, but if we were all to agree, let's just say we're all so aligned that we're going to agree on what AI ethics is, what our principles are, what our values are, that's all great. But what about everybody in Phoenix? What about everybody in the United States? What about everybody in the world? And that's what makes it so difficult. And so diversity, yes, it's a problem and it's also necessary. Why is this important? Okay, well, we're actually creating AI in our own image. What do I mean by that? You've heard about neural networks. Those are modeled on the human brain. Well, guess what? We don't understand the human brain completely, but we're using that as a model. Great, guys. <laughs> I'm not totally thrilled about that. I can understand it intellectually. I think it's fascinating, I mean, after all. But I think we're a little bit haughty, if you ask me. Um, and I think that we need to be very careful about that because when I talk to people about this, when I talk to technologists about this, I ask them how confident they are that they can control these things. And we've, had, we've seen things go awry. You've seen the Taybot from Microsoft, perhaps, in 24 hours. That went from being, hey, hi, I'm Tay, nice to meet you, to all kinds of racist stuff, really, sexist stuff. It was really bad. Uh, AI, uh, Facebook AI research. They had two bots that started talking to each other. They developed their own language. And the researchers shut it down because it, it, they didn't understand what it was doing. Okay, this is just, these are pretty benign examples. But this is why we have to be careful. We're, I think, getting overconfident about what we can do. We're running very, very quickly. And in fact, that's my next point. Because up to this point, and again, I come out of Silicon Valley, Innovation has been about the art of the possible and fa fast financial returns. Okay, I'm not gonna change that. However, 
there's a real difference between the technologies we've had before and the technologies we have now. I hear this all the time. It's just a tool, right? It's just a tool like any other tool, right? Well, up to this point, we've had assistive technologies, and these are too. But when you talk about self-learning systems, that's a different thing. When was the last time, like your hammer, jumped up and did something unexpected. Your computer does it all the time, by the way, thanks to microservices, thank you very much. But, um, but the point is, is that there's a lot of stuff we don't understand. We were talking about transparency before and the need to understand what are these systems coming up with. And again, they're not all equal systems, but what is the reasoning that went into it? What is the result? We don't understand these things. And you're talking about one AI instance in this case. What happens when you have a network of these things? You don't understand what one is doing, but you've got all of these other instances talking to each other. So I'm just, my point is that we need to be careful and we need to think very carefully about what we're doing because in my opinion, what we've been doing to date, as we've done it, is not sustainable going forward. So where does it apply? Well, okay, so the reason that I have a box around R&D here is because that's where I'm focused. In fact, I'm from high tech industry and uh, I deal with business a lot, and so generally we're talking about how do we build this into our systems? How do we build digital ethics into our systems? But engineers don't work in a vacuum. I mean, they report to people. They've got users, right? They've got leaders. We've got shareholders that we have to report to. Um, we have customers and partners that have expectations of us, society. I mean, if this is gonna become a brand issue, we as society have to get together and say, hey, we don't like what you're doing, right? I mean, you're already seeing pushback, right, on social media with some of this unethical stuff that's going on. But you need to have the financial levers. You need to have the management levers. You need to have all of this stuff working together, which is what my next slide is all about. And the reason is, is because I'm not gonna go into all of these in detail because we wanna get to the Q&A. But the point is, is that each one of these groups has got responsibilities and we all have to work together the hard part is getting agreement about this. Do we need res regulation? Yes, we do, and it's too bad there's no police chiefs, but I mean, hope is not a good form of behavioral management, okay? It just isn't. So I'm not saying that we need to like regulate to the point where we can't innovate, but we need to have a balance because this whole notion of innovation at any cost is unacceptable, and that's what we're doing. We're running very fast. You probably noticed when you use Gmail, for example, when you're using your computer, your computer is constantly rebooting. Your apps are constantly being updated, right? The software developers are doing this thing called continuous delivery and continuous deployment. But that means to say that they're delivering software faster and faster and faster and faster and faster. We're not thinking about what we're doing and we're moving faster and faster and faster. So it's like arming a bunch of kindergartners in the, in the yard with scissors and tell them, go ahead, run, have a good time. Okay, so that's kind of where we're at. So I'm, my message really is that we just need to think about this. I told you I'm, I'm on the phone day and night talking to people, okay? I was talking to a Fortune 500 executive and that was his exact comment, okay? It's my grandkids' problem. Okay, I agree that we're, we haven't reached Skynet yet and I'm not saying that we're going to, but I am telling you this. And we, we all do have our opinions. It really is up to us what our future is, because we absolutely have it within our power to destroy ourselves. And we absolutely have it in our power to help ourselves. The question is, what are we going to do? But it's not my responsibility only, it's your responsibility. So we all have to work together. So, and we need to do it now, because we're moving very quickly. And if we don't start thinking about this now, it's going to be too late. We can't wait 50 years to think about this. So the, w the way that we're gonna do this is we have to update our systems. You're seeing universities, actually I'm heading up a, a new initiative for the IEEE now, which is about education. We're going out to engineers, we're putting together some curricula uh, for global uh, universities around the globe. It's, it's gonna be a lot of fun and uh, very interesting. And the good news is, is that the younger generations, like some of us, are more socially aware, I think, than our generation was, and one of the reasons is because they're exposed to social media. They've been, they've grown up in a completely different America than we have. We have to prioritize this and we have to update our policies. You can't just hope that everybody's going to do the right thing, because they won't. You also have to adjust the financial incentives. If you're not doing the right thing, if you're working for me, 
I'm going to I'm going to dock your pay, you know, or I'm going to incentivize you. You know, either way, it's carrot and stick, right? Same with shareholders. Shit, same with the VCs. And people are starting to wake up for this. Build it in. We need to build it into our products, and we need to build it into our service, and we need to also test for it and monitor it and make sure that it's not going awry. So, you know, my message to everybody here really is, you know, be the change you want to see in the world. Uh, whether you believe in Skynet or not, uh, really doesn't matter. But we are right now, we are at a point in history where what we do right now is going to matter. And so I'm just going to ask you all, hopefully, please join me in this fight because we really need to think harder. So thank you very much. Okay, so thank you, Mike, Moji, and Lisa. Uh, we now are at that point in the program where we flip it over to you and we want to invite questions. So I'm gonna take the microphone from here and we have a couple of microphones that we are going to circulate. And what we'd like to ask is the person or people that are gonna ask questions that you stand, you tell us who you are, and then you pose your question and we'll let the panel decide uh, who's comfortable taking questions. So. Who would like to begin? Wow, that didn't take very long. Okay, so <laughs> let me give you this microphone. Let me take that one as well. <laughs> Thanks, Anne. I'm, my name is Frank Royals. I'm on the board of the Center for Leadership Ethics. I'm from Dallas. Uh, I actually live one mile from the Gandhi National Memorial. But my question is, what is, is there a, an accepted definition of artificial intelligence? If I go back to Dallas and I'm telling people that I came to this seminar and somebody says, what is your definition of artificial intelligence? I look at a calculator that can do two plus two. To me, that's artificial intelligence. But where, where does that stop and real artificial intelligence begin? So artificial intelligence has been around for 50, 60 years. It's basically an algorithm, basically any sort of computing that we do. What a better terminology for this sort of technology, I think, is machine learning, which is a more specific uh, aspect of AI. Um, so I think the language should be machine learning, not AI. Let's see if anybody else agrees. So I definitely get the pain. Uh, I've been doing research in this area for 15 plus years and there is no clear definition. Uh, one time we had one of our PhD researchers do a, a kind of tutorial for the entire company that uh, acts on the work at. And in the beginning, he said exactly, artificial intelligence is a way for computers to do um, things intelligently. And with that definition, calculator is on artificial intelligence. But what has happened in the field, like Mike uh, explained since the 50s, they said artificial intelligence is a way for uh, computers to do things that had been previously um, only done by humans in terms of intelligence. Now, and, and the boundary has really shifted. In the beginning, they, if you had asked people in the 60s and 50s and 70s, if you found an algorithm that can recognize handwritten digits better than humans, is that true AI? They would have said absolutely yes. If the, they would have asked them if, you, if, if it can translate the language to the other one in real time, they would have said yes. But if you ask people now, they say no, because that's, um, Clear, we can see how it works. It's kind of a simple algorithm, and we train it with some data. So I think it's a philosophical question, and, and uh, there's this mystery of what intelligence is. Um, and again, there's no clear definition, but like Mike explained, there is machine learning that, that is, has been at the core of most of the recent developments. That's the reason you hear more about AI than you didn't as much like 10 years ago, because there has been this huge. Uh, explosion of progress given deep learning and, and machine learning. Um, and that has a very clear definition. That's a, a type of software where uh, it can adapt and learn based on 
training data. So a programmer typically writes a set of instructions for the computer to run. In the case of machine learning, um, the, the number of steps that need to be run are learned from data. Okay, so I'll say that the short answer is no, also. Well, and also, a lot of the algorithms that we have today that are operating have been around like for 30 years. We didn't have the data that we needed for them to operate from. So anyway, but the short answer is no. It's a collection of things, as I mentioned earlier. Um, just one more thing about kind of this technology being, it has been around forever. So the technology, even the algorithms, has been around for a long time, but what has enabled machine learning is uh, graphical processing units that are super powerful and are able to run a bunch of uh, parallel computations at the same time. So technology has caught up with the algorithms. Um, the technology has been there forever, but we're finally uh, able to have the tools that allow us to actually use that. And that's just been in about the past five years that uh, GPU processors, um, like from NVIDIA or whatever, have become uh, enabling us to do this. Okay. Next question. Well, my name is Hector Garcia. I'm an MBA student and I actually work for a local utility, electrical utility, Salt River project. And for years, uh, the electrical utilities to govern themselves. And in recent years, we've had the uh, federal agencies step in and have to basically set up some guidelines and directions for us because of the misconduct of, or mismanagement, I should say, of other utilities. In this industry, I, I could see that if, if this technology was a, available to a volatile leader or an unstable government, this wonderful tool could be used as a weapon. Is it enough for the industry to regulate itself or what do we need in an international level to be able to prevent something really bad happening or, or any, any type of harm that could really impact uh, global peace on a global scale? Yes, so this has kind of happened in, in China already. If you have heard about uh, SenseTime, I think there's a company that, that has provided face recognition technologies to the government. And it's not exactly clear, the reports are coming out, how much of it is true, but uh, apparently if you do shoplifting anywhere in China, they can find you in, in a minute. And everywhere is monitored by camera, and, and, and uh, there's this real-time face recognition that tracks people around, and historically they can know where, where you've been. So yes, there is a real threat of, of governments and uh, authoritarian regimes to misuse this technology, and we do, do need international regulations. The real question is that, that balance, how much regulation do we put in place to uh, not impede the research at the same time make, make sure we don't do something super stupid, which I think in this case it has happened in, in China and uh, that's why I, I mentioned that the American example of, of having uh, small businesses and, and people on the ground taking action and, and regulating themselves from, from the bottom up, that that's the best way to do it. And yes, there are international communities and, and uh, panels and bodies trying to bring international regulations into this. Europe is, is super active in this. The US government has taken many inputs and, and sessions from experts in the field trying to understand the technology and, and bring in some, some level of regulation. Um, the challenge is that balance. I have two thoughts on the subject. One is, is that as I said, I'm talking to people about AI ethics all the time. And the reality is, is that bad things are going to happen because not everybody's going to be responsible. We see that in society every single day right now. The second thing is, it, it gets back to diversity. In other words, just regulating the United States, that's fine within our borders, but that's not going to help the world necessarily. We need to work with other governments. Um, and it is not just the lawmakers. I mean, for example, even with the IEEE, we've got lawmakers, we have attorneys, we have technologists, we have business people like me. I mean, we've got a real diverse group here. And in fact, the group that I'm in is the most diverse group in the IEEE, and it has to be that way because you have to bring all these disciplines together at the college level, university level. You've got to bring the engineering department, the philosophy department, the psychology department, all of these different things. It's a much more complex problem than we faced before, and we need to approach it. I don't have anything more to add than what Lisa just said, other than um, the fact that uh, I don't think our government is capable of 
uh, our governmental leaders right now have the knowledge base to actually uh, provide the rules and stuff that we need. So as a community and a technologist, we need to be able to provide that input to our senators and our congressmen because it's clear that they don't understand the technology as well as we do. That's true. Yeah. I appreciate that they, they recognize that there has been a number of Senate hearings this year uh, inviting in uh, AI experts to explain and, and uh, do it in a, in a very uh, good way, to, in, in my belief, they're approaching it in the right way. Okay. Next question. Hey there, I'm Doug Singh. Uh, I don't know if this is a question, I think it's more of uh, what I think, and so I don't know if I'm right or if I'm wrong, and so I guess your input might be helpful, but it seems to me that the technology in industry is probably as big as any. Um, I don't know a whole lot about AI, but what I hear about are things like my iPhone listens to me. And if I'm talking about you know, wanting to buy a pair of pants, suddenly when I'm on the internet, those pants are showing up in front of me. Or whatever that little Amazon device is that I put on my kitchen counter is recording what's going on in my house. Um, and so you start to see those stories or hear those things, and it says to me that although technology is fantastic and the industry certainly has the opportunity to do amazing things. When it comes to monetizing uh, those things, the industry is its biggest enemy because it does it with a huge lack of transparency. I mean, if you tell me this device is going to record what goes on in my house and the purpose behind it is, it hears me talk about how there's no milk in the refrigerator and suddenly the Amazon truck pulls up and drops it off in front of the house, that's fantastic if I know it. But if I don't know it, um, you know, I think it's kind of a crappy deal. Uh, and so, you know, I think as this evolves and we hear more and more of those stories, it says to me, assuming they're true, that the technology industry is going to create big problems for itself when it comes to monetizing these things because of a lack of transparency. And so since you guys are sitting in the industry all day, uh, give me your thoughts. Okay, so first of all, it's not true that the Amazon Echo listens to you all the time. It only, uh, both the Amazon Echo and that uh, Google Home only listen after the keyword is, you know, uh, Alexa or uh, Hey Google. So, so we have been told. Yeah. So we have been told, but, uh, <laughs> but so th this is actually what I kind of what I wanted to talk about. So it really is the responsibility sometimes, and it has been the responsibility of the technology companies to self-regulate in this case because if it does turn out that the echoes are listening all the time, people will learn that and it's up and people won't keep them in their homes. So up till now, it has been the industry's responsibility to self-regulate, but I don't think that long term that's going to be sustainable. Yeah, so I think this is one good example of when um, government regulation can help. So there is this um, outline and a regulation coming out from Europe called GDPR. I can never remember what it stands for, but it's, I call it Good Data Practice Rules. That's not the real acronym, but it's something. General Data Protection Regulation. General Data Protection Regulation. Yes. So, <laughs> it's the same as Good Data Practice Rules. <laughs> so GDPR is, is, is con uh, trying to address the, the exact same concern, that when you uh, purchase or are a customer of a, of a digital technology, you need to know how it's making its decisions, what, what the algorithms are, what are its inputs, what are its outputs, what are the data retention policy, policies. So um, every single company that operates in Europe, starting from a couple of months ago now, they are required to uh, be very transparent and publish those information. So I'm sure Alexa has to do that. Uh, I know my company, Axon, has to do that for our European uh, customers. And that's one example of government coming in, giving a very high level and, and reasonable uh, guardrails and regulations and, and letting the industry to develop and uh, uh, kind of abide to, to, to those rules, uh, not at the level that will impede their progress. 
Okay, so over the years I've become kind of a scary old girl. And I'm going to use a real <laughs> scary word here, which is acquiescence. I mean, it's one thing, yes, the technology industry continues to innovate and we keep doing things because we can. And this is one of the things I have a problem with, is that we're doing things because we can and not thinking about the long-term consequences, both good and bad. And what happens when we adopt technology, we get all wrapped up in the good, and we talk about the cell phones and all the stuff we can do, what we can do with Amazon Echo and all these things. We, we focus on the good, the good, and it isn't until something really egregious happens that we go, hey, wait a second. And in fact, you can even see this reflected, for example, in the Gartner hype cycle, as well as Jeffrey Morris crossing the chasm. You see all this excitement and it drops off a cliff, right? But the thing is, is that we as society, we're acquiescing to these things, right? It's okay. Oh, it's okay that I'm wearing Fitbit and it's, you know, you're monitoring me. Wherever I go, you're monitoring my heartbeat. Well, okay, what about, like, the healthcare industry? Right now, you're going to give me a better uh, rate if I wear one of these things? Well, what happens when it becomes non-optional? I mean, we go from acquiescence to acceptance to mandatory control. And I'm telling you, we're losing our liberties really quickly, and we're handing them away with a click of a mouse. We're not reading the terms and conditions. We're not, we don't get educated ourselves. So it's not just the people who are designing this. I mean, really, if, if Apple couldn't make any money at all, or Amazon couldn't make any money at all, because we didn't allow them to, that would be a different thing. But we're allowing all this. So, we got one more question, and then I'm going to ask one of our panelists to take the question uh, in about 45 seconds. <laughs> I don't know if I the question out, that's not good. Um, so I have a question about the methodology of these uh, ethics researchers that are saying, hey, this is unethical. Um, specifically, when I was listening to the pictures and identifying images, one person was in a room saying, hey, this is unethical because of X, Y, Z. We can't identify males versus females. What are her guardrails? How did she come up with the data? Did she have <coughs> information on each of the photos that she was looking at? And she knew 100% this is male, this is female. Did she know 100% this is a, a black female, this is a white female? So just kind of a question there. And a bigger question is, who's taking a look at the people blowing the whistle? Yes, so uh, in the specific case of uh, misclassifying people's uh, people versus humans, which is horrible, um, there are these data sets that came, that most of them came from the academic community, and uh, they've kind of scrambled together the data sets based on what's out there. So basically it's a reflection of how many white male pictures are out there on the internet versus black male pictures. And uh, a lot of these machine learning techniques are basically statistical methods of uh, uh, finding patterns and regularities in data. And if you, if you feed it something that's 75% one class, it's, it's going to uh, be biased towards that. Um, I want to, however, emphasize that, and people get a bit confused about this, that what we call bias here is, is very different from, from human bias. Um, uh, to make it, you're stressing me out. <laughs> make it quick, sorry. So, uh, the, the same kind of problem, the exact same technical problem that causes an algorithm to uh, confuse between a car and a chicken is the exact same problem that makes it confuse between a gorilla and a black male. So, I would I want to say the algorithm is innocent. It's it's basically reflecting the bias that's in our data sets. So I'd like to call it the stupidity problem of the our, of our methods of algorithms and not the bias problem. If, if we think about it that way, we don't get emotional and we, we try to address the real problem. Um, one quick thing that, that uh, I noticed last night when I was flying in at the airport was that when, when you go through the, the gate, sometimes the alarm goes off and says random check. That's one example of, of a machine actually uh, generating something that, that is less biased than humans. And if you had to ask a human, and, uh, no matter how hard they would have tried, they would have said that they're biased and it's more likely they're biased. So we always have to compare our options and alternatives and now versus new, basically. And, and a lot of times we have a bias towards now. Sometimes the new thing is better.
It is definitely the desired effect if you still feel like there are questions and more, uh, more information that you'd like to gain on the topic. So that's also part of the uh, symposium is, is to really kind of get you on the edge of your seats and, and hopefully inspire you to continue to, to look into these incredible technologies. Um, I'd like to thank each of our panelists. We have a small gift of appreciation for each of you. So uh, Anne is going to help me out here. We've got a new Eller. Uh, Center for Leadership Ethics Polo for each of our guests, for, for Lisa, for Moji, and for Mike. How about a round of applause for our panelists? And we do have a recording of this year's symposium, as we've done in years past. It usually takes us a couple of weeks or you know, right around until we post it on our website. So if you'd like to revisit anything that you uh, saw today or you'd like to share that with anyone, just direct them to our website. And uh, finally, I'd like to thank, again, both Claudia and Doug for just their generous sponsorship. It was a wonderful event, and uh, we just want to say a sincere thank you again to your, for your support. Thank you. And that wraps up our program. So um, if you'd like to continue to exchange business cards, it's a wonderful networking opportunity. You've got some time. Uh, otherwise, we just want to thank you all for, for coming out this morning. We uh, understood very clearly after talking with our chairman, Mr. Uh, Russ Johnson, who's the president and CEO of Merchants Information Solutions, that if you're going to bring a program to Phoenix, you got to change it up. So that's why we're doing it in the morning. We're trying to get everybody out of here at 9 so that you can go on to your work. So again, thank you for all your leadership and to all my board members. Have a great afternoon. Thanks, everyone.